Good evening, and thank you for attending our program tonight, Managing Treatment-Related Side Effects of Blood Cancers, presented by Dr. Deborah Katz from Rush University Medical Center. My name is Carrie Callis, and I'm the Director of Programs at the Leukemia Research Foundation. We're pleased to present this program tonight in partnership with the Cancer Wellness Center. As a brief background about the Leukemia Research Foundation, the foundation's mission is to conquer all blood cancers by funding researches, research into their causes and cures and enriching the quality of life of those touched by these diseases. Raising over $80 million in support of its mission since it began in 1946, the foundation has funded research grants to over 500 new investigators on five continents and supports patients and families living with a blood cancer diagnosis through educational and support programs. To learn more, please visit our website, allbloodcancers.org. The Leukemia Research Foundation and the Cancer Wellness Center have partnered together uh, to offer a few programs over the years, and we are always honored to work with them as they do amazing work in support of cancer patients and families. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Savina from Cancer Wellness Center to introduce herself and our presenter tonight, Dr. Katz. Over to Thank you, Savina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Carrie. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Savina Chachava. I'm the program manager at the Cancer Wellness Center. Um, for those of you unfamiliar, the Cancer Wellness Center is a nonprofit organization aimed to improve the physical and emotional well-being of those um, impacted by cancer as well as their families. Um, we provide a variety of free programs and services, uh, including education programs like the one this evening, um, support services, counseling and group, um, and wellness classes. For more information, visit cancerwellness.org, and we'll put both websites um, in the chat so that you're familiar and, and can easily access them. Before we get started on just a few housekeeping items, um, please note your audio and video are disabled for this program. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them out in the Q&A box. Um, and Dr. Katz will um, answer those questions at the end. After the program, you will receive an, um, our evaluation. We do ask that you take a couple of minutes and provide your feedback. We really do appreciate um, and um, appreciate every feedback that we get. Uh, now, without further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker for the evening, Dr. Deborah Katz. Um, Dr. Katz is an assistant professor of medicine in the section of hematology at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. She received her medical degree from Albany Medical College and went to complete her internal medicine training um, uh, and hematology oncology fellowship training at Rush University Medical Center. She specializes in hematology with a specific focus in the area of acute leukemia and lymphomas. Thank you and welcome Dr. Deborah Katz. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to speak um, this evening. Um, if you all bear with me, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Okay. And just confirmation that you all can see. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm going to speaking, uh, speak this evening about how to best manage treatment related side effects of blood cancers. So just to take a step back, I wanted to talk a little bit about what blood cancers are. Um, so these are cancers that begin in blood forming tissue, um, such as bone marrow or in the cells of the immune system. These cancers change the way that blood cells behave and how well they work. Um, and there are three different types of blood cells. White blood cells that fight infection as part of your immune system red blood cells that carry oxygen to your organs and tissues, and platelets that help um, your blood clot when you are injured. There are three major types of blood cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. Leukemias are cancers of the white blood cells or cells that go on to become white blood cells. And leukemias can either be acute, meaning fast growing, or chronic, meaning slower growing. Lymphomas are cancers of the lymphatic system, which is an important part of the immune system. In particular, the lymph nodes, which are small bean-shaped structures of the lymphatic system that filter out harmful substances. Lymphomas affect a type of white blood cell called lymphocytes. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells, which are lymphocytes that make antibodies to protect against infections. 
So these cancers cause your bone marrow and lymphatic system to make blood cells that do not work as well as they should. Blood cancers affect different ways, um, different types of white blood cells, and they can act in different ways. Um, treatment for blood cancers depends on a lot of different factors. This includes the specific type of blood cancer, extent of disease, um, the presence or absence of symptoms, the age of a patient, um, patient comorbidities, functional status of, of patients, as well as a variety of other factors. Treatment for blood cancers has vastly improved over the past several decades, and many types of blood cancers are now highly treatable. And the goal of treatment, whether this is with curative intent for prolonged survival or for palliation, may vary depending on the type of cancer and also patient-specific factors. Treatments for blood cancers come in various forms and treatment might be with a combination of drugs and or different treatment modalities. So common treatments for blood cancers include chemotherapy. Um, this refers to drugs that kill and halt the production of cancer cells. Radiation therapy, which uses high energy x-rays or other beams to damage cancer cells and stop their growth. Targeted therapies, these utilize drugs that specifically kill cancer cells by targeting specific abnormalities present within those cancer cells with minimal harm to normal cells. Stem cell transplantation, which involves healthy stem cells that are infused into the body to help resume healthy blood production following therapy to destroy cancer cells immunotherapy, which uses one's immune system to fight cancer. There is a specialized treatment called chimeric antigen receptor um, or CAR T cell therapy that uses engineered immune cells to fight cancer by taking one's body's germ fighting T cells, engineers them to fight cancer and infuses them back into your body. And clinical trials also provide an important therapeutic option in the treatment of blood cancers. Clinical trials are investigations to test new cancer treatments and new ways of using existing treatments. Cancer treatments have the potential to cause side effects and treatments, um, it's important to remember, are given at high enough levels to treat the cancer while at the same time trying to keep side effects at a minimum. And it's important to remember that one, not every person develops side effects. Severity of side effects varies from person to person. Side effects can be long-term and some might be short-term. And side effects can be acute um, or can even be delayed occurring well past completion of treatment. So there are many side effects that can occur with blood cancer treatment. And some of the common side effects I've list listed here, um, including fatigue, hair loss, easy bruising and bleeding, infection, anemia, which refers to low red blood cell counts, nausea and vomiting, appetite changes, constipation or diarrhea, mouth, tongue and throat problems, such as sores and pain with swallowing, peripheral neuropathy or other nerve problems, such as numbness, tingling, and pain, skin and nail changes, such as dry skin and color changes, urine and bladder changes, weight changes, chemo brain, which can affect concentration and focus, mood changes, changes in libido and sexual function, and fertility problems. Unfortunately, I will only have time to highlight a few of the more common side effects tonight. And I really hope to provide you with a better understanding of cancer related side effects and maybe some suggestions as to how you might be able to manage symptoms in conjunction with your treatment team. So when approaching management of side effects secondary to blood cancer treatments, it's important to have an open communication um, between patient and your care team. And this oftentimes includes not only your physician, but nurses, um, advanced practice providers, and other care providers. It is also sometimes beneficial to include other experts to assist in managing side effects. And some additional consultants may include dietitians or nutritionists, psychosocial oncologists, medical subspecialists, such as neurologists, cardiologists or cardio-oncologists, palliative care physicians who are experts in both symptom and pain management, 
um, alternative medicine practitioners, and physical and occupational therapists. So I wanted to start by talking a bit about cancer-related fatigue. Um, fatigue is one of the most common problems experienced by cancer patients. And the majority of patients will experience some level of fatigue during their treatment course, with approximately a third of patients having persistent fatigue for a number of years after treatment. This can have a profound effect on a patient um, and a significant impact on their family. And fatigue is routinely identified as one of the most distressing symptoms. Well, what is cancer-related fatigue and how does this differ from just average fatigue? So cancer-related fatigue is defined as a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer or cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent activity and that significantly interferes with usual functioning. Cancer-related fatigue differs from the fatigue that accompanies everyday life, which is usually temporary and relieved by rest. Factors that can contribute to cancer-related fatigue include cancer therapies, um, disease progression or growth of a tumor, unrelieved or untreated pain, anemia. Um, it can also um, be due to factors related to metabolic, hormonal, and nutritional issues, such as poor nutrition, fluid or electrolyte disturbances, thyroid dysfunction, hypogonadism, menopause, and dehydration. It might be related to comorbid conditions, including heart or lung problems, kidney or liver issues, endocrine dysfunction, infection, or neuromuscular disorders. Medication side effects, particularly um, sedation as a result of analgesics or pain medications, physical deconditioning, depressed mood, emotional distress, and sleep disturbances all can contribute to cancer-related fatigue. So if any factors are known to be associated with fatigue are identified, these really should be addressed as the initial approach to cancer-related fatigue. It is really important to optimize management of physical symptoms such as pain, nausea, and shortness of breath in order to alleviate fatigue symptoms. Improving upon anemia with red blood cell transfusions or other therapies can oftentimes help with fatigue-related symptoms. Sleep disturbance can significantly contribute to cancer-related fatigue, and therefore specific measures to improve sleep hygiene should be suggested. These can include such things as exercise, limiting the number of naps during the daytime, avoidance of alcohol, caffeine, or um, chocolate or nicotine prior to bed. It's also recommended perhaps to limit the amount of liquids prior to bedtime, um, sleep hygiene um, recommendations oftentimes include turning off the television an hour before bedtime. Um, for people who have challenges, quote unquote, turning off their brain, um, one can consider making a list of things to do prior to bedtime in um, an effort to um, minimize that brain being turned on and preventing one from sleeping. Um, at bedtime, it's recommended that you try to maintain the same sleep and waking schedule from day to day um, to use your bedroom really as a place to sleep and not as a, as a place to read or watch TV or to do work. Um, if you have trouble falling asleep after 15 minutes, um, one can suggest getting up, going to a different room and um, doing something quiet, listening to music. Um, trying to avoid any stimulating activities like watching television. And then when you feel drowsy, going back to the bedroom to try to sleep again. There are several non-pharmacologic interventions that um, also have been shown to assist with cancer-related fatigue, um, including cognitive behavior and psychosocial interventions. And these approaches really provide strategies to help manage cancer-related fatigue and guidance on monitoring of fatigue levels. And some specific suggestions um, on how to conserve energy during activities of 
day-to-day active, um, day-to-day living. So for example, um, some of the interventions surrounding planning and organizing might include alternating tasks that take a lot of energy with those that don't take as much energy, um, delegating as much as possible. So this not only helps you to get tasks done, but it also makes those in your life feel useful um, and to help when they want to help. Um, Eliminating steps or tasks that are not essential and might be able to be done um, at a different time or combining chores or errands. Um, Thinking about arranging your household so that most activities might be able to be done on a single floor. Um, Some of the interventions surrounding how to pace things um, include balancing activities so you can alternate between resting and doing activities. Um, Stopping to rest um, before you get tired, even if that means stopping in the middle of a task. Trying to avoid spurts of activity, um, as this can oftentimes drain energy. Pacing activities on good days as well as bad days and developing a routine to prevent overdoing. Um, Other suggestions related to positioning, Consider sitting down whenever possible, using assistive devices um, and adaptive equipment such as walkers, scooters, canes, handrails, crutches. Um, This really can help save energy by allowing you to do things without having to bend or reach. Really prioritizing, focus on the things that you enjoy doing and be realistic with yourself. In terms of intervention surrounding meal prep, Um, Assembling all ingredients before getting started, using mixes or prepackaged foods, um, using cookware that you can serve from, storing frequently used items at chest level to minimize having to bend over or reach for items. Some interventions surrounding childcare are to plan activities or outings at a place that will allow you to sit down or lie down if need be, taking advantage of daycare programs, Um, If you have older children, maybe teaching those children how to make a game out of household chores. Um, If you are working, um, whether it's during the course of your treatment or afterwards, you know, plan work around the best times of day, create shortcuts, you know, take some breaks, and if possible, even consider working part-time. There are a lot of other suggestions and way to conserve energy when it comes to bathing, grooming, dressing, um, housework, and shopping. Um, And so it's really important to explore these strategies um, as possible ways to um, mitigate some of the fatigue surrounding um, cancer treatment. It is important to note that these strategies are not necessarily recommended for cancer survivors in whom regular physical activity really truly is encouraged. So other non-pharmacologic interventions to treat cancer-related fatigue include exercise and mind-body interventions. So unless contraindicated, um, you know, if you have something like lytic um, bone lesions, um, significant impairment of blood counts, active infections or fevers, or there's a safety concern, it really is recommended um, for those going through active treatment or those who have completed treatment to take on an individualized program of moderate aerobic exercise. Um, Guidelines from ASCO, which is the American College of Clinical Oncology for management of adult cancer survivors with fatigue recommends for 150 minutes of moderate aerobic exercise, which includes fast walking, cycling, swimming per week um, with an additional two to three strength training sessions weekly. Um, That might seem like quite a bit. um, So really any exercise really is encouraged and recommended. For cancer survivors with persistent fatigue, mindfulness practices um, or mindfulness-based approaches like um, mindfulness-based stress reduction is recommended. So these mind-body interventions include mindfulness-based approaches where one really practices to focus on the present, um, yoga, acupuncture, and other approaches that might include things like touch therapy, massage therapy, music therapy, relaxation, or Reiki therapy. 
trials studying the benefit of pharmacologic therapies to improve cancer-related fatigue are limited. Um, however, there is potential benefit with some pharmacologic agents. For example, use of psychostimulants and other wakefulness agents might help with symptoms of cancer-related fatigue. For men with hypogonadism, use of testosterone supplementation might be beneficial. For patients receiving opioids, um, opioid analgesics or pain medication should be titrated or the pain, pain management schedule or agent modified so as to alleviate pain without significantly altering mentation. Antidepressants can also be used in the management of cancer-related fatigue. Glucocorticoids, which are steroids, are often used in the terminal phase of illness to help with symptoms of fatigue. Some complementary medicine approaches have utilized vitamins um, and ginseng and or guarana to help with fatigue-related symptoms. It is important to ensure that supplements do not interfere with active treatment or with other medications. And you should always discuss the use of supplements with your physician prior to starting one. So switching gears a little bit, um, I wanted to talk a bit about chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. So peripheral neuropathy um, is a very common side effect seen with blood cancer treatments. Peripheral neuropathy describes a set of symptoms caused by damage to the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord, and these distant nerves are called peripheral nerves. Some chemotherapy drugs can damage peripheral nerves and cause symptoms. However, it is important to recognize that um, peripheral neuropathy can be due to other causes. For example, other cancer treatments like surgery or radiation can cause peripheral neuropathy, tumors pressing on nerves, infections that affect nerves, spinal cord injuries, diabetes, alcohol abuse, shingles, low vitamin B levels, certain autoimmune disorders, HIV and poor circulation as seen in the setting of peripheral vascular disease, these can all lead to symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. Um, and because of this, it is really important to first determine the cause of peripheral neuropathy in order to provide um, best management strategies. So symptoms of chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy may include tingling or a pins and needles type sensation, burning or warm feeling, numbness, weakness, discomfort or pain, impaired ability to feel hot and cold, and or having cramps. These symptoms can affect one's ability to do things like walk, write, button your shirt, or pick up a coin. Chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy can severely affect quality of life and potentially even impact treatment. The incidence varies based on the type of chemotherapy agent used, dose, duration of exposure, and patient comorbidities. Common hematologic drugs that are associated with neuropathy include um, the platinum class of drugs, um, for example, cisplatin, um, and drugs like vincristine or bortezomib. Symptoms can be short-lived or symptoms can persist. So are there really any preventative strategies? So there are no established agents that can be recommended to prevent chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy, but there are several um, interventions with potential but unproven benefit. So these include cryotherapy, compression therapy, exercise, acupuncture, as well as others. There are also potentially beneficial measures for specific drugs. So with the use of the drug vincristine, many protocols recommend capping the dose. Um, this means setting an upper limit dose regardless of patient size. With the use of the drug bortezomib, weekly dosing rather than twice weekly dosing and subcutaneous administration rather than intravenous administration has the potential to decrease rates of chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. 
So treatment options for management of chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy include adjustments to drug dose, um, administration, or regimen. And this is generally based on severity of symptoms. So in general, patients with mild symptoms can continue to receive full doses. However, if symptoms increase in severity or the neuropathy interferes with functionality, the risk of potentially disabling neurotoxicity must be weighed against the benefit of continuing with treatment. And your doctor may need to discuss with you the appropriate, appropriateness of dose reduction, um, dose delay, dose discontinuation, or even altering treatment um, altogether. Occasionally, um, patients can be switched to an alternative less neurotoxic agent if there is one available. Decisions regarding drug adjustments might be impacted by intent of treatment. For example, whether treatment is um, curative or whether it is palliative in the setting of incurable cancers. Other strategies for managing chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy include physical therapy and rehabilitation, which can help with abnormal gait and or mobility deficits, in addition to enhancing postural control and balance to prevent falls. Other management approaches might include exercise and acupuncture. So various medications have been used to help manage symptoms of chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy. Medication options include duloxetine, tricyclic antidepressants, gabapentinoids, glutamine, as well as topical treatments. So once again, um, shifting gears a little bit, um, focusing on nausea and vomiting, which are two common side effects um, experiencing, experienced by those undergoing um, blood cancer treatment. Nausea, um, the feeling of being queasy or sick to your stomach with or without vomiting can be caused by your cancer um, or cancer treatment. Um, if caused by chemotherapy, symptoms can occur on the day you receive your treatment and can last for three or more days after your chemotherapy. If you are receiving radiation therapy, symptoms may start within one to two hours after receiving treatment to your chest, belly, or pelvis, and may last for several hours. Other causes of nausea and vomiting include intense pain, fatigue, illness, other medications, and the stress of coping with cancer. Feeling nauseous for a long time can affect your appetite and can cause you to lose weight. If you vomit a lot, you can get dehydrated and have other problems from losing body salts. So one of the most important strategies for managing nausea and vomiting is prevention. So to find an effective treatment for nausea and vomiting, it is important to know what is causing the problem. Prescription medication is often needed to control nausea from chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Nausea from anxiety and fatigue can often be managed by using physical and mental relaxation techniques or by even making changes in, in your diet. Effective treatment for nausea may be different for each person. Um, your physician oftentimes will assess the amatogenic potential um, of a chemotherapy regimen, as well as factor in patient-specific risk factors for nausea and vomiting. Anti-nausea anti medication um, are preemptively incorporated into the chemotherapy treatment plan in order to prevent nausea and vomiting. Additionally, the use of breakthrough or rescue anti-nausea medications is recommended. It is important to continually reassess um, for symptoms of nausea and vomiting and to modify the anti-nausea me um, medications and regimen as needed. To be able to effectively do this, it's really important for ongoing communication between the patient and um, the patient's medical team. So non-pharmacologic strategies for management of nausea and vomiting include behavioral interventions such as relaxation, biofeedback, self-hypnosis, cognitive distraction, guided imagery, acupuncture, and even consideration for systemic uh, desensitization, systematic desensitization. 
Some suggestions to consider um, for managing nausea and vomiting include eating six to eight small meals a day rather than three large meals, rinsing your mouth out to help remove any bad pastes, bland foods and foods served um, cool or at room temperature are oftentimes easier to eat than hot and spicy foods. Foods that are very sweet, fatty, greasy, or spicy can aggravate nausea. Creating a peaceful eating place, if possible, can oftentimes help symptoms of nausea and vomiting. So suggest um, creating a relaxed atmosphere that will help calm you and, making eat, and make eating easier. Eating in a room that is well ventilated and not smelling strongly of food or cooking odors. These things can all be beneficial. Some additional suggestions um, for managing nausea and vomiting include sipping fruit juices, sports drink, or flat soda throughout the day, sucking on hard candies such as peppermints, lemon drops, or root beer, root beer barrels can relieve nausea and get rid of the bad taste in your mouth. And remember, it's really important to stay hydrated, especially in the setting of nausea and vomiting. There are many different uh, types of anti-nausea medications that are available to help manage um, these symptoms. Um, these drugs include serotonin receptor antagonists, corticosteroids, substance P neurokinin 1 receptor antagonists, atypical antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, phenothiazines, and other medications. Your, your physician may prescribe anti-nausea medications from different drug classes and provide recommendations on a dosing schedule. So diarrhea and constipation are also pretty common side effects um, that are experienced by patients undergoing blood cancer treatments. Diarrhea is often defined as having more than two loose or watery stools per day. Um, it can be caused by cancer treatments. However, it is important um, to evaluate for other causes of diarrhea, including infectious etiologies. Uncontrolled diarrhea can lead to weakness, poor appetite, dehydration, and weight loss. Because you lose fluids with diarrhea, um, you really need to take, um, take in plenty of clear fluids, um, clear liquids throughout the day. It is often easier to tolerate liquids at room temperature, and it is recommended to avoid drinking beverages with caffeine. Um, it's suggested to eat small meals or snacks throughout the day and try to drink at least one cup of liquid after each loose bowel movement. Other suggestions for managing chemotherapy-related diarrhea include drinking and eating high-sodium foods, such as broths, soups, sports drinks, crackers, and pretzels, drinking and eating high-potassium foods, such as fruit juices and nectars, potatoes without the skin, and bananas. Um, this can help replace electrolytes lost through persistent diarrhea. It's also recommended to eat foods that are high in pectin, um, such as applesauce and bananas. Pectin uh, increases viscosity and volume of stool um, to help mitigate um, these side effects. It's recommended to avoid eating greasy, fried, spicy, or very sweet foods. Um, one can consider limiting milk or milk products and using lactose-free products instead. Avoid drinks and foods that cause gas, such as carbonated drinks, or gas forming vegetables. Limit the use of sugar-free gums and candies made with sorbitol, since sorbitol can cause diarrhea, gas, and bloating. Consider the use of bulking agents um, containing psyllium fiber like Metamucil. So psyllium fiber helps with diarrhea because it absorbs water, which can add bulk to the stool. Loperamide, octreotide, tincture of opium are medications that can be recommended and prescribed to help manage symptoms of chemotherapy-related diarrhea. Constipation refers to being unable to move your bowels, having bowel movements less often than is normal for you, or having to push harder to move your bowels than you have in the past. Constipation can cause pain and discomfort. 
Um, while certain medications used to treat blood cancers can contribute to constipation, being less active, eating or drinking less, or taking certain medications can also contribute um, to constipation. Keeping your bowel movements regular and easy to pass is very important. Some strategies to manage constipation include eating at regular times each day and drinking enough fluids. If you are at risk for constipation or have constipation, establishing a bowel plan, uh, bowel plan to be regular um, would be recommended. And this may include um, over-the-counter medications such as Senecot, Colace, Metamucil, or any other preparation containing psyllium fiber. Again, it is recommended that you discuss any symptoms with your doctor or your medical team and ask about the use of laxatives um, or stool softeners um, with your providers. Cancer and cancer treatments um, can sometimes cause the throat to become very sore and make it hard to eat and swallow. And certain chemotherapy agents and radiation therapy to head, neck, or chest area can make the inside of the throat quite irritated. Some patients may even experience heartburn and gastric or acid reflux type symptoms. Mucositis is painful inflammation and ulceration of the mucous membranes lining the digestive tract. Mucositis usually occurs as an adverse effect of chemotherapy and or radiotherapy treatments. Mucositis can occur anywhere along the gastrointestinal tract, but oral mucositis refers to the particular inflammation and ulceration that occurs in the mouth. So is there a way to prevent mucositis? Well, one option that can sometimes help prevent mucositis is cryotherapy. And this involves placement of ice chips or popsicles in the mouth during chemotherapy. This can cool the oral tissues and cause vasoconstriction. And this um, can decrease blood flow to the region and therefore restrict the amount of chemotherapy drugs that are delivered to those specific tissues. However, the mainstay of mucositis treatment is largely supportive. Um, this includes pain management, oral hygiene, and use of magic mouthwash, which does include a topical anesthetic. Other suggestions for managing mucositis or a sore or irritated throat include eating foods that are bland, semi-solid, or soft and easy to swallow. Making smoothies with soothing fruits like melons, bananas, peaches, and kiwi fruit, and even adding um, items for extra protein like yogurt, milk, ice cream, or silken tofu. Um, it's important to take your time when you eat, chew and swallow foods carefully and allow ample time between bites. Choose lukewarm or cool foods that are soothing. Um, very cold foods or very hot foods can sometimes cause distress. Several small meals a day are easier to eat and digest than three large meals, and it's recommended to space meals around two to three hours apart to get the most comfort. Remember to stop eating two to three hours before bed and to sleep with your head elevated if gastric reflux and heartburn are problems for you. Your physician might prescribe medications that can numb and soothe your mouth or throat. Again, this includes um, magic mouthwash um, and pain medications. Nutritional supplements such as liquid meal replacements might also be quite helpful during this time. It's recommended to avoid tart, acidic, or salty beverages um, and foods, which can be quite irritating. Foods that may cause discomfort um, include citrus fruit juices like grapefruit, orange, lemon, or lime, pickled or vinegary type foods like relishes and pickles, tomato-based foods, um, including chili, salsa, pasta sauces, and pizza, and certain broths um, might make things worse. Um, it's recommended to avoid coarse or rough textured foods. Um, be sure to blend or moisten foods that are dry and solid. Avoid commercial mouthwashes, alcoholic and acidic beverages, and tobacco since these can dry and irritate your mouth. 
Avoid strong spices like chili powder, cloves, curry, hot sauces, nutmeg, nutmeg and peppers. Changes in taste and smell um, are commonly experienced by patients receiving cancer therapy. Some common types of taste changes include decreased ability to taste foods or loss of taste, altered taste or food not tasting the same as it used to. For example, sweet, bitter, and salty tastes can seem very different, and many patients might experience a metallic taste in the mouth. Taste and smell are closely related, so patients receiving cancer treatment may also experience changes in their sense of smell. Usually, the sense of smell becomes more sensitive, particularly to odors that are unpleasant, such as body odors or hospital smells. Changes in the senses of taste and smell can lead to food dislikes or aversions and ultimately result in decreased intake of food and weight loss. Making sure that you are able to eat properly and maintain weight during cancer treatment is very essential and being aware of issues with food intake and nutrition is important. It is imperative to communicate with your medical team and let them know about changes in your sense of smell or taste that prevent you from being able to maintain your intake of food and fluids. It's important to let them know about symptoms such as nausea or vomiting that interfere with your ability to keep food or fluids down. And it's important to also let them know about any unintentional weight loss. So what are some ways that you can manage changes in taste and smell? Well, if food tastes good, eat it. Um, if food no longer tastes right, avoid those foods. Eliminate odors that may affect taste. So some suggestions include using a kitchen fan when cooking, using an outdoor barbecue grill to cook, certainly not in this weather, um, but in the summertime or in the springtime, just consider this, um, using boiling bags, covered pots or microwave ovens. Cold foods are usually associated with fewer odor odors than warm or hot foods. If a metallic taste is present, um, try smooth blended foods. Chewing gum or sucking on hard candies can be helpful in minimizing uh, that metallic taste. Foods that are spicy with rough texture should be avoided. Chewing foods well and taking fluid in the mouth which, with each bite can really help that food get down to the taste buds. Sometimes uh, red meats no longer taste good, so consider using um, other sources of protein like poultry, fish, eggs, peanut butter, um, cooked dried beans, peas, or dairy products. Marinate your fish and sweet fruit juice, wine, salad dressings, or barbecue sauce to help improve the taste. And use herbs and spices such as oregano, rosemary, tarragon, and lemon juice to enhance the taste of foods. Um, aromatic herbs may enhance the flavor recognition. Try new and attractively prepared foods to help make the meal more appetizing. Sugar can oftentimes be used to tone down salty foods. Um, the flavor of starchy foods like rice or pasta may be improved if they're not prepared with butter or margarine. And tart foods like orange juice, pickles, lemonade, vinegar, and lemon juice may also be helpful in improving flavor. Loss of appetite is very common um, during blood cancer treatment. Decreased appetite can lead to less food intake weight loss, poor nutrition, and loss of muscle and strength. This is common in cancer patients and can happen because of side effects of cancer treatment. Um, and this can be due to such side effects as nausea or changes um, in the skin inside of your mouth. Sometimes changes in appetite can also be related to the cancer itself. Um, cancer can cause changes in appetite and metabolism. And these problems can interfere with one's ability to eat normally. So how to prevent loss of appetite? Well, be aware of the, any changes in your eating habits or weight from time of diagnosis. Be sure to consume enough calories and maintain your weight so that you feel your best during cancer treatment. Preventing weight loss and muscle wasting are important goals that can help you remain active. Many people might require education about what constitutes a healthy diet um, or assistance from a certified dietitian. 
small meals, again, are more manageable than large, um, less frequent meals. Um, selecting calorie dense foods can oftentimes be of help. Um, these foods include such things as pasta, rice, bread, um, potatoes, oils, nuts, nut butters, avocados, and bananas. Making sure that your diet contains foods that are a good source of protein, um, carbohydrates, and fats. So some examples of good proteins include uh, meats like lamb, beef, chicken, and turkey, um, fish, cheese, eggs, um, beans, tofu, Greek yogurt, um, and even protein dense um, bars like Cliff Bars or use of Carnation Instant um, Breakfast. Um, good carbohydrates include whole grains such as oatmeal, wild rice, quinoa, barley, buckwheat, um, wheat berries, um, eating cereals, pastas, fruits, starchy vegetables like peas and potatoes. Um, and good fats um, include such things as whole milk, ice cream, olives, oils, and peanut butter. Mild exercise, even 10 to 20 minutes a day can help stimulate appetite. Um, additional support may be needed um, with use of a certified dietitian. And there are some pharmacologic interventions that can help with um, stimulation of appetite. Magestrol acetate and glucocorticoids, for example. So I wanted to, again, shift gears a little bit and talk about neutropenic precautions. Um, so neutropenia um, refers to a low white blood cell count. Uh, neutrophils are a type of white blood cell that helps the body fight infection. People with neutropenia have a low number of these white blood cells, so it might be harder for their bodies to fight infection. Neutropenia can be caused by certain cancer treatments or it can be caused by cancer itself. Um, cancer can decrease, um, can cause a decrease in the body's ability to form normal new neutrophils. And the risk of infection increases based on the absolute neutrophil count. When you have a low neutrophil count, is, it is important to protect yourself against infection. It is also important to call your doctor as soon as you feel like you may be getting an infection. Um, it's important to understand that you may not have typical warning signs of infection when the neutrophil count is low. So please check your temperature regularly. Recognize that some medications may cover up fever, um, in particular medications like Tylenol. Let your doctor know if you are developing any symptoms such as fever, chills, new cough, congestion, sore throat, any new skin changes or rashes, slow wound healing, burning with urination, diarrhea, or any tenderness at the site of a catheter. So ways to protect against infection include things like hand washing, so hand washing is one of the best ways to stop the spread of infection. Limiting visitors, um, staying away from people who are coughing, sneezing, or sniffling, people with colds, flu, or other contagious diseases should not visit you. Um, obviously minimizing exposure to crowds. Um, you should be aware of how many people that you're near um, and certainly wearing crowds, um, wearing masks in crowding areas. Um, in the time of COVID, a lot of um, these things are universal and not even uh, specific to patients who are going through blood cancer treatments. Other ways to protect against infection include um, safe food preparation and storage. So washing hands, utensils, counters, and tables with hot soapy water before and after preparing food, um, keeping all raw meat and seafood away from ready to eat foods, um, defrosting food in the refrigerator, refrigerating or free freezing leftovers within two hours, and not using any leftovers that have been in the refrigerator for more than two days, um, and not eating from other people's plates, utensils, or glasses. You know, preventative care can also help reduce the risk of infection, and this includes such things as oral hygiene. So good mouth care is very important using um, soft toothbrush, um, brushing your teeth gently, um, but thoroughly um, within 30 minutes following meals and before bed, um, trying to keep your lips moist um, uh, to avoid any cracking. 
Um, and checking with your medical team prior to having any dental work done is really important. Um, preventative skin care um, is also um, important in, in terms of preventing infection. Um, it's important to avoid uh, getting cuts and scratches. If you see any changes such as redness, swelling, sores, drainage, or rashes, um, or if you have any pain or tenderness, it's important to notify your medical team. You can keep your skin healthy by showering and bathing daily um, using mild soaps, um, using a mild lotion um, for dry skin, um, and avoiding the use of any perfumed lotions. Um, if you run into any problems with scrapes or cuts, just cleaning that area with soap and warm water. Wearing shoes or slippers when you're walking um, and washing your hands before eating and before um, preparing food and after going to the bathroom um, is also uh, necessary to protect against infection. You can consider wearing gloves when washing dishes. Um, we oftentimes will recommend filing nails instead of cutting them um, and avoid making those nails too short. Um, avoiding going to nail salons. Um, consider using an electric razor when shaving to minimize the, minimize the likelihood of any nicks or cuts. Um, avoid gardening and mowing the lawn or wear gloves when you're doing these activities. If you have a central venous catheter before you shower, it's important to use waterproof material um, to cover that, in, that uh, dressing um, and injection cap. So it's important to also uh, protect against infection when it comes to lung health. Um, so any sign or symptom of a potential lung infection, like shortness of breath, new cough, coughing up mucus, chest or back pain, um, please report this to your medical team. Um, avoiding dusty and stuffy areas like attics and basements, uh, avoiding um, smoking or places where there's cigarette smoke, avoiding close contact with sick, sick people, avoiding grooming pets or cleaning litter boxes um, also is important when it comes to lung health. Um, if you are using humidify, humidifiers, especially during the winter time with the dry air, um, please remember to empty, dry, and refill with clean, fresh water. When it comes to bladder health, um, urinary tract infections are common amongst patients with low white blood cells, and symptoms of um, bladder infections can include painful urination, blood in the urine, urine, low back pain or low pelvic pain, change in the odor or look of the urine. And it's important to, again, notify your um, doctor or medical team about any concerning symptoms. In order to um, hopefully prevent any sort of bladder infections, please um, try to be thoughtful about drinking fluids throughout the day, emptying your bladder frequently. When it comes to the rectal area, um, this can be a source, source of um, uh, bacteria um, and bacteria can enter the body very easily. Um, this can be in the setting of constipation, which oftentimes will lead to straining, which can cause tears in the rectal area or irritation of hemorrhoids. So once again, it's important to notify your medical team of any symptoms of infection like pain, burning, or itching um, of the rectal area, painful bowel movements, or any uncomfortable hemorrhoids. Um, in order to prevent any infection stemming from the rectal area, um, staying hydrated, having a high fiber diet, um, using a good bowel regimen, but avoiding the use of suppositories or enemas, do not use these. Um, and of course, good hygiene with soap and water um, as needed. Infection um, and infection, infectious complications can be common in those undergoing uh, blood cancer treatments. Infection is the process by which germs enter a susceptible site in the body and multiply, um, resulting in disease. Infection is a common problem in persons with cancer, and people with cancer are at an increased risk of infection due not only to their underlying disease and side effects of treat and also side effects of treatment, 
which um, can affect or interfere with the body's normal defense against infection. Um, there is a significant concern with infection when it occurs in the setting of neutropenia. So again, um, things to think about, notifying your medical team if you have a temperature, if you have chills, if you have any new or persistent cough, nasal congestion, sinus drainage, sore throat, or ear pain and discomfort, a toothache, white patches or ulcers in the mouth, inflamed areas or soreness in the mouth or throat, increasing fatigue and weakness, flushed appearance of the skin or excessive sweating, or a new rash or sore or any redness or tenderness of the skin, slow healing of a wound or an incision, burning or urgency with urination, redness, tearing or draining of your eyes, diarrhea, difficulty waking up, redness, drainage, swelling or tenderness in the area of wounds or piercings. If you have a central venous catheter, redness, drainage, swelling or tenderness along the tunnel um, or at the exit site or swelling in the face, neck or arms where the catheter is located. Um, any of these symptoms really should be brought to the attention of your medical team. Certain medications um, may be given after each cycle of chemotherapy to prevent your white blood cell count um, from falling too low and staying low for too long. Antimicrobial medications may be prescribed to prevent specific infections that are common when the immune system is suppressed by chemotherapy or other medications. And other antibiotics or antimicrobials um, are oftentimes recommended to treat specific types of infections as the need arises. So um, as I end this, this talk, I really wanted to kind of circle back to some of the take home points. Um, there are many different types of blood cancers and the need for treatment or the type of treatment that is recommended varies widely and depends on many different factors. Cancer treatments certainly have the potential to cause side effects. However, it is important to remember that there might be other reasons for symptoms. Regular and frequent communication with your medical team is recommended to address and readdress symptoms that you might be, a, might be experiencing in order to um, optimize things as best as possible. So with that, um, I will stop and open um, the floor for any questions um, as they pop up. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz, for that very informative presentation. Um, just a reminder to all of you attending, if you want to type a question into the Q&A box, um, we will address those now with um, Dr. Katz. So Dr. Katz, we had um, a question submitted in advance of the program actually. Um, and the question was, at what point do you change immunotherapy drugs if you're experiencing extreme side effects from your current one? Yeah. So this is a, a great question, um, and I, I don't know if it's a one approach fits all uh, type of answer. I think, um, you know, in the field that um, we're in, our um, goal is really to provide benefit and not provide harm. Um, that really is kind of what things come down to. Um, and if at some point um, there is more harm with a particular therapy or treatment, um, sometimes that very much outweighs whatever sort of clinical benefit we are seeing. Um, and this oftentimes is a discussion between the patient and the provider. Um, you know, it's important for a patient to be able to explain the types of symptoms that they're experiencing, um, the degree to which they're experiencing those symptoms, um, and how much those symptoms are impacting their um, quality of life or their day to day. Um, we do have guidelines that we generally follow in order to be able to gauge um, symptom severity. Um, and oftentimes, if those symptoms are um, considered quite severe or are severely impacting quality of life or functionality, um, even if that treatment is uh, working, it might be recommended to switch to an alternative therapy, um, once again, because the benefits um, are not outweighing those risks and those toxicities. Great, thank you. 
Sure. Um, there was a question, actually, there were two about um, a little bit more about neuropathy. Sure. Um, one was, can severe orthostatic symptoms be considered a type of neuropathy? Um, yeah, that's, a, I guess, a little bit of a, <laughs> a, a challenging question to ask. Um, there are uh, um, a lot of uh, chemotherapy drugs that have the potential to cause um, neurologic symptoms or neurotoxicity. And um, it is possible that some of the symptoms that fall under the category of neurotoxicity um, could manifest with really severe um, orthostatic type symptoms um, with hemodynamic instability, um, fluctuations of blood pressure, you know, feeling lightheaded or dizzy. Um, I think the challenge is, is that there's also a lot of medical conditions that might also contribute to similar types of symptoms. So, um, you know, one of the one of the um, kind of common themes during, during this talk was that, yes, while a lot of symptoms can be because of chemotherapy um, treatments or cancer treatments or even cancer itself, there are a lot of medical conditions that can have very similar um, symptoms, if not the same symptoms. Um, and so it really is important to be able to um, think through um, what uh, possible etiologies might be causing any set of symptoms and be able to look into this a little bit further to be able to really set forth a, um, a management plan or a treatment plan that makes sense. So um, I guess the short answer to the question is, yes, it's certainly possible that those symptoms might be related to um, cancer treatment, but it is also equally possible that um, those symptoms could be related to um, other medical issues um, altogether. Okay. Um, this next question looks to be um, a little bit more about medications and treatments. Um, and I may butcher some of these medication names, but I'm gonna try my best to read them. Okay. Um, so the father is 75 years old, diagnosed with AML slash MDS. He was diagnosed last year. Um, he had a relapse and is now taking azacitidine and venetoclax. His overall health is good. And recently he's been advised to take um, Volsevier 500 tab and trimethoprim. Um, her question is whether this medicine is a must, if it's even necessary to take these medications. Um, there's no reference to specific side effects in this question, but um, I'm not sure if, if you might be able to address this in some manner. Yeah, you know, without knowing the specific details of, of the case, Oftentimes, patients with um, the types of blood cancers that were mentioned, um, acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome, um, the blood counts, particularly the white blood cell count, can tend to run very, very low um, and be low for prolonged periods of time. And as I mentioned, when the white blood cell count is very low, um, patients are at risk for infections. And oftentimes we see infections that um, are uh, viral in nature, fungal in nature, and bacterial in nature. And there are medications that are oftentimes recommended by doctors, um, including I believe some of the ones that were mentioned in this question um, that are used as prophylactic um, antimicrobial drugs. So um, used in as a preventative um, uh, measures, knowing that these patients tend to be at very high risk for certain types of infections. So, um, are these medications always a must, um, meaning are they being prescribed with the intent to treat an active infection? Not always the case, um, but they are oftentimes uh, used to hopefully prevent a patient from running into specific infections. Um, and I would always say under these circumstances, um, should a patient like this who is um, 
immune compromised um, based on their underlying blood cancer, as well as the fact that they're actively receiving chemotherapy, run into any infectious complications, that can certainly be um, a very challenging situation and certainly cause perhaps significant um, morbidity, if not mortality. Um, so if there are measures that we're able to take, like these preventative antifungal, antiviral, or antibacterial drugs to hopefully avoid this type of circumstance, um, we recommend that, especially when the side effect profile of these medications is generally um, very minimal, very generally very well tolerated. So um, hopefully that answers the question. Um, but once again, you know, I always encourage people to, you know, be advocates for themselves and their family members. Um, and so certainly being part of this forum, I already know that the person who asked this question is advocating for their family and wanting to be informed, but it's certainly always okay to, you know, ask your doctor, what is the purpose of this medication? Um, do I have to take it? Um, and what would happen if I, if I don't, um, to be able to have that shared decision-making with your um, physician um, and care team. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, the next question is um, from, from a register, a participant who has graft versus host disease from a stem cell transplant last March. The mouth rinse that this person is currently using does not really seem to alleviate it. And is there anything else that may be available to help? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, in full disclosure, I um, am not a transplant um, hematologist, so I very rarely have to manage graft versus host disease. I usually um, uh, do not care for patients with graft versus host disease as my transplant colleagues um, do so. But in general, um, for symptoms related to mouth sores or mouth discomforts, if uh, topical rinse like the magic mouthwash um, or we oftentimes will call it a stomatitis cocktail, if that is not sufficient, um, sometimes pain medication is required to help manage those symptoms. Um, the other component to graft versus host disease is, um, is there some manipulations of medications that might be able to um, you know, overcome graft versus host disease or kind of minimize the degree to which a patient is experiencing graft versus host disease? This oftentimes um, you know, relies on titration or, or manipulations of various immunosuppressive drugs. So that is certainly something that your, you know, transplant team or your hematology team would be working on. But in the meantime, to manage those side effects or those symptoms, um, if something, you know, less intensive is not working like a mouthwash, um, then sometimes stronger pain medications are needed. Um, the next question is, um, the participant has been taking a Ciclovir daily for five years, and is there any problem with this? Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, I would say if there's a good reason to take um, a Ciclovir daily, um, then that is generally, I would imagine, what is being recommended by the provider. I can't think of any major drawbacks right off the bat, bat of taking this medication um, every day if this is needed. Great. Um, there was also a question about if we, um, and this isn't really specific to you, Dr. Katz, but if we would have a seminar on treating some of the immunotherapy side effects that don't require changing drugs because the patient is doing so well on the therapy. Um, so that um, is an interesting question. And I think certainly when we do the program evaluation, we do ask a question on there. Um, if you have any suggestions for future programs that, um, that you would be interested in that you think are a need for blood cancer patients and families. Um, so the next question is, have you seen delayed side effects from vincristine, specifically orthostatic hypertension? And I hope I didn't butcher those words. No, um <laughs> I haven't specifically seen that as a delayed side effect. Okay, great. Um, it looks like that is all the questions that were submitted. So thank you for covering those. 
Um, and at this point, I would like to thank Dr. Katz. Um, she, you know, volunteered her time this evening to share all of this information with patients and families, and we so appreciate that. Um, to everyone who's participating today, um, please know that we will be sending the recording of this program as well as Dr. Katz's presentation to everybody. So if you missed something, you could always go back and take a look at it. Um, I also wanted to share that as Savina said at the beginning, we will be um, sending out a program evaluation shortly after the program this evening. So please fill it out. It takes, I promise, just a minute or two to do. And we really do take all of that feedback seriously so that we can improve future programs. Um, so Savina, unless you have anything else, I just wanted to say on behalf of the Leukemia Research Foundation and the Cancer Wellness Center, thank you so much for participating and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Carrie, and thank you, Dr. Katz. Of course, thank you for um, inviting me. I, I very appreciate this opportunity to, to share with um, patients and their family members.